Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Jody Prescott. I'm a lecturer at the University of Vermont, where I teach environmental law, energy law and climate change, and cybersecurity law and policy. Honored to be the moderator today for our panel on Pacific Area Command Area of Operations. Our panelists today are Commander Junko Kawashima, Japan Maritime Self-Defense Force, Dr. Saira Yaman, Daniel K. Inoue, Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies in Honolulu, and Major Dana Grigg, SGA for the uh, 152nd Airlift Wing, Nevada Air, I should say Nevada, not Nevada, there we go, National Guard out of Reno, Nevada. Uh, we're delighted to have Commander Kawashima back with us for this conference. Chukasan, pleasure to have you back. She's currently serving in Brussels as the Japanese representative to NATO on gender matters. And today she's going to talk to us about the work of the Japan Self-Defense Forces in implementing the Japanese National Action Plan. Prior to this assignment, she was the commander of the JS Setayuki, a Hatsuyuki-class destroyer currently serving as a training vessel. Major Grigg began her Air Force career as an information manager with the 263rd Combat Communications Squadron in the North Carolina Air National Guard in 2001. She received her commission as an officer in 2007, and she graduated from Charlotte Law School in 2010 and then became a judge advocate. She then became a staff judge advocate for the wing in 2012. She's going to talk to us about gender issues in Polynesia, Tonga. Dr. Yaman is the fac on the faculty of the Inouye Center, as I mentioned, and today she'll talk to us about the center's work in building gender capacity in the Pacific Basin through executive education of security practitioners. She'll be presenting a paper that she co-authored with Lieutenant Colonel Michael Burgoyne. Her areas of expertise include conflict analysis and resolution, international peace and security, and state fragility, failure, and stabilization processes. Dr. Yaman has taught at George Mason and at Qiyad al-Azam University in Islamabad, and she's been at the Inouye Center since 2012. Ladies, it's a pleasure to have you with us here today. Without further ado, Junko-san, I turn it over to you. Okay. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Commander Kawashima from the Japan Maritime Self-Defense Force and I'm working at the NATO headquarters in Women, Peace, and Security Office. I'm very honored to have been invited to speak at this conference. Thank you. And today, I would like to talk about gender perspectives in chaotic situations, especially focusing on disaster relief operations in 2011. And the UNSGL, 1325, the importance of gender perspectives is being accepted in the Japan Self-Defense Force. It is, however, more important for the Japan Ground Self Forces uh, compared to the Air Defense Force and the Maritime Self-Defense Force. I assume this situation is similar in other countries. Uh, currently, Japan is deploying headquarters staff members to UNDPKO in South Sudan. And as such, Japan has learned, uh, learned the importance of gender perspectives through the experience of participation in PKO. Uh, since I am a surface officer in the JMSDF, I have been thinking about the necessity of gender perspectives in the maritime and Navy's domains. I will talk about gender perspectives for the JMSDF gained through my operational experience Focus on the Great East Japan earthquake in 2011 and explain about the leadership from the viewpoint of gender. Uh, first, I wish to mention the geographical characteristics of Japan. Uh, it strongly influences missions and operations of JSDF. As shown on the screen, Japan is surrounded by sea and there are four connected tectonic plates around Japan. Also, there are typhoon tracks passing over Japan, especially during the summer season, bringing heavy rain. Uh, these features result in frequent earthquakes and the tsunamis, floods, landslides, sometimes damaging nuclear reactors. The pie chart shows that uh, 
sorry. Here. <laughs> uh, shows that 16% uh, of the heavy earthquakes and tsunamis in the world have hit Japan between 1900 to 2011. Uh, due to such natural disasters, the JSDF has many disaster relief missions. On average, we have a uh, disaster relief operation once a month. What kind of damage occurs in such ca uh, catastrophic disaster? It mainly is concerned mass casualties, loss of government function, damage to infra infrastructure, living in shelters, shortage of water and food, worsening hygiene and environmental conditions, and so on. During the Great East Japan earthquake, there, are, there were reports that women and girls were raped during the chaotic situation, chaotic situation. In terms of security and safety of civilians, armed conflict and natural disasters share similar conditions, I think. From the viewpoint of uh, human security, Natural disasters affect both the state and individuals, and from the point of view of maritime security, disaster relief is one of the stability, stability operations similar to those used to deal with piracy, terrorist challenges, illegal activities, migration, refugees, trafficking, and so on. Uh, before moving to talk about gender perspectives in disaster relief operations, I would like to explain about the present situation concerning women in uh, the MSDF, as it is one of the gender issues for our organization. As of April 2017, the number of women in the MSDF is around th uh, 3,000, which is about 6.6%. The aim is to increase this number to more than 9% by 2030, and the MSDF is considering abolishing its uh, policy of recruiting men and women separately, and ultimately to hire more than 10% women every year. Concerning the removal of placement restrictions, submarines are currently not open to women for reasons related to the protection of the female body from physical harm caused by the pressure in submarines. However, the plan to place female crews on board of submarines is currently under consideration. Regarding system to support child care and nursing care, both men and women are encouraged to take child care leave uh, this includes effective use of flex time and making use of day, day nursery. Uh, the MSDF focuses on high number of women's retirement due to giving birth and child care, and the systems are being developed for women. This includes providing them with education on skill recovery during their maternity leave and hiring them again after the retirement. Uh, concerning leaders, the first active woman was promoted to Leah Admiral in the MSDF, MSDF last year, and the first uh, female commander of the escort division was assigned last March. The escort division consists of four destroyers, uh, including Izumo. Uh, this female commander was one of the first women to gra graduate from the National Defense Academy. After graduating the Defense Academy or Civil University, all, we all receive the same education regardless of gender. It is becoming more common to have female commanding officer on ships and a female flight division chiefs, but in fact, it takes more than 20 years to make female commanders. From my experience as a commanding officer of a frigate type ship, a commander should be asked to be a commander for his or her qualities and skills, regardless of gender. I believe 
that uh, education as a criteria for evaluation should be the same if we want to have commanders who can make uh, the right decisions. There are women onboarding in every type of ships in the MSDF, including Aegis ships, and its percentage is up to around 10%. One of the issues for the MSDF is to make an effective allocation of the quarters, both for men and women, because Japanese people tend to feel uncomfortable when always being the, in the same quarter with unfamiliar people. Uh, some missions for ships are long term, such as overseas training crews and act research, uh, taking more than six months. In such missions, female uh, doctors are often required to be assigned as a ship doctor and a hospital corpsman to take care of the female crew and researchers. Regarding the Im improvement of the working environment, including the prevention of sexual harassment, all the units in the MSDF are required to assign a counselor who is in charge of preventing sexual harassment and power harassment, and also improvement of the working environment for female and both male. Senior sergeant, female seniors, and ex executive, uh, executive officers are usually assigned to this role. However, uh, they are not gender advisors who have received a specialized education on gender issues. Their role of, uh, to give a helping hands to those who are suffering and to provide regular education to all members in their unit. Also, at least once every half year, commanders in every unit must conduct interviews with each of their unit's members in order to find issues such as sexual harassment and to solve problems at the early stage. We also have an uh, online service in the MSDF uh, intercompany network and a hotline to share worries, to report incidents, or to submit comments to improve the working environment for women. Now, I would like to talk about gender perspectives in the operation in the MSDF. Uh, first, I would like to outline the circumstances of the greatest Japan earthquake. Uh, its magnitude was 9, uh, 9.0, uh, the biggest earthquake so far. The biggest tsunami was up to 45 meters in height. The number of dead was uh, six, 16,000, and more than 2,600 people went missing. The impact of the tsunami heavily damaged the nuclear power plant. The MSDF deployed more than 60 ships and about 100 aircraft and helicopters to the disaster area. The MSDF's mission was search and rescue, transportation of supplies, information gathering to find isolated areas and people who remained without support and support for victims in shelters. I think that the MSDF needs gender perspectives when we faced civilians, especially weak people, because they were easily affected in chaotic situations. From a viewpoint of four pillars of UNSCR 1325, I would say our operations were related to three, uh, these three pillars on the screen protection of women and girls in emergency humanitarian situations, participation of women at all levels of uh, decision making in operation as military, relief and recovery through a gender lens by respecting the civilian and considering the needs of women and girls. The MSDF operations includes gender perspective as shown on the screen uh, uh, concerning life support, a space and quarter exclusively for women was made, where they could chat, taking a rest, look after babies, and relax. Bath 
rooms were separated by gender. Laundry support was offered by separate male and female crews, and supplies for women and babies were sorted by women according to needs of women. Female hospital corpsmen were desired by many women who listened to the requ uh, re requests from women and gather information. Some destroyers even provided a temporary shelter for children. Uh, transport ships offered all of these types of support together in a single program, which takes a half a day and move around several positions in the operation area. One of the data showed that uh, more than 60% of the people who used this uh, program were women. Above all, the most, uh, sorry. No. Above all, the most effective role of women was gathering information. For example, uh, there are isolated areas or people who remained with the support. Uh, what kind of supplies and services do women need? Uh, where are the people who need help, such as pregnant women, children, elderly people who need nursing, disabled people, and so on? Uh, the MSDF could share such information with other government agencies, such as police, the fire service, and the local government and NGOs and international organizations. Moreover, they played an important role as a kind of advisors for the male commanders. One of the male commanders said to me after the earthquake that he realized the effectiveness of gender perspective in disaster relief operations. Gender perspective are not systematically established in the MSDF. And I suppose one of the reasons is that the word gender perspectives is not well defined yet in the MSDF. There are, however, some facts that, are point, uh, that point out that the MSDF used gender perspectives in operation at the field level. Through the experience of the Great East Japan earthquake, I again realized that commanders serve an important role to accomplish, accomplish the mission more smoothly and effectively, also from a gender point of view. Gender perspectives uh, could be used effectively in the Navy's operation when we face civilians in chaotic situations. And I think that it is important to incorporate gender perspectives on an operational and a strategic level. At the tactical and operational level, uh, officers or clues, members who know civil affairs or CIMIC are required. Concerning planning, it is necessary to pay attention to the weak people and uh, include, uh, to include gender sensitive information into the concept of the operation. Trainings and education is most important and we should provide a training on gender issues as a basic knowledge in HADR operations. At the operational and strategic level, planning should be include officers with civil affairs, CIMIC expertise. Concerning training and education, we should offer opportunities for commanders to hone their knowledge of their issues, agenda issues. One of the important role of the Navy in disaster relief operations is to provide well-organized support soon after the disaster has occurred, when there are still few governmental and non-governmental groups starting their activities in the devastated area, while demonstrating the Navy's characteristics, mobility, capacity, and self-sustainability. Uh, every country is in the different maritime security environment and every Navy has different mission according to the security environment. Some conduct many disaster relief operations. Some are facing issues related to migrants, human trafficking, border control, and ter terrorist attacks. Uh, sorry, okay. Chaotic situation uh, different every country. However, there are possibilities for navies 
when uh, responding to such chaotic situations in terms of confronting the tra uh, treating civilians, and we should prepare for them. Uh, this is my last slide. <laughs> uh, to conclude my presentation, I'd like to mention future steps for the MSDF. First of all, uh, awareness of the importance of gender perspectives in uh, human uh, HADR operations should be raised, especially toward commanders. Secondly, we should learn from best practices and the lessons learned, including the experience of international organization, NGOs, <laughs> civil society regarding gender issues. Thirdly, uh, thirdly to share the best practices and the lessons learned in operation under chaotic circumstances with other navies in the world, and hopefully to create a manual on gender perspectives in HADL operations. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Joko san. Dana, the floor is yours. Thank you. Oh, Thank you so much. I have no slides, but uh, being 17 years military, it's hard to break the uh, practice of standing up when you're talking, <laughs> briefing, especially when I have two army people over here I'm talking to, too. So it's a, it's a real privilege and honor to uh, represent the Nevada National Guard and to share some of our experiences that we had over in Tonga. Um, I really appreciate Dr. Rahm and, and Dr. Moffat for allowing us to be here. And I'm hoping to give more of a practical lens to some of the theoretical that, uh, that I know uh, these big brains in here talk about daily. Um, Nevada it was lucky enough to be a part and, and have been a, has been a part of an effort in Tonga. And just to ask some of you, how many of you are, are familiar with the Nevada Nas or excuse me, the National Guard program? Okay, that's good. I always try to educate when I come and talk. How many, how many of you are uh, familiar with uh, the State Partnership Program? Oh, excellent. Okay, so that makes it my life a little bit easier. I can give more cliff notes and, and dig into it um, from there. So we had a stellar team that was put together from the Nevada National Guard, not just from the military perspective of the Air and Army that worked together, but also because of the civilians that went with us. So two of those people are here, and that's Dr. Rahm and Dr. Yamin. So you'll be able to talk to them offline as well and get some of their shared experiences if you want something outside of a military lens as well. Um, we also had Mr. Mickey Yakovich, who is from Inclusive Security. He went with us. He had a lot of the, the depth in the national action plan. And so basically, that was our mission in May. We went in uh, earlier this month, May 7th through 12th, and we went there basically to see if we had any, any value added in, in our being there and also promoting a national action plan for women's peace and security. And luckily we did. That's why I'm here today, I think. So just to tie back into the state partnership program and to give a brief explanation for those of you that didn't raise their, your hand, the state partnership program is an exclusive mission that's tied to the National Guard. And what that mission particularly does is it basically pairs the different states, the different National Guards, with countries that have been vetted through OSD and have expressed an interest in having the uh, United States military to come in and partner in an exchange of ideas to include increasing interoperability, professionalism, and other initiatives, and in this case, women's peace and security. So specifically in Tonga, we had, um, we started our partnership back around 2014, and that actually uh, began in, in, a, in a pilot program that I was involved in as just an attorney. I just went out there as a as a uh, observer to to see what was what we were doing out there, what we could add, what kind of value added, I went back as an attorney, and basically helped to expand their their uh, their legal program and to start their budding JAG Corps because they did not have one at the time, and so by the time that 2017 rolled around, we received we get a new director, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Lau, who's here today, and he took over the pro program in July 2017. He came and spoke to me and he said. He said, Dana, he says, uh, I've heard you've been out of Tonga a couple times. What have been your experiences? I just give him a general background on what I did. And he goes, I'm going to make you my women's peace security lead. 
And so I'm like, okay, I, I don't know much about women's visa security than what I have, have gone to in conferences. I had gone to a couple in uh, military operations and law uh, out in PACOM. I had uh, talked about it at, at the PACOM level a few times, but I said, I can, I can learn this, and, and, uh, and I'm excited to learn about it. And so from there, he said, well, that's good, because you're going in two months. You're going back to Tonga, and you're going to put on uh, a little presentation for the Tongans. So at that point, I, uh, I read up on what I could very quickly uh, or garner from, from a knowledge basis of what I need to do as a, as a U.S. person over there with this mission of seeing if there's any interest in, the, uh, in women's peace and security for Tonga. Um, so basically what, what happened at that point in time was I said, okay, well, we have this 2011 uh, National Action Plan that the U.S. did. Why don't I brief that? That's what we do, right? As military personnel, you take what you, what you can, and, and as an attorney, you plagiarize well, and you, and you put that out there, and you say, this is what I, what I think I know and what I think um, you're supposed to know. So I did that, and I realized very quickly that I had no idea what I was really talking about, and I needed a better team. And so that's why we went back in May. So why did I give you all that background? Because um, if I can pass on anything to you all today, besides the practical application, is to also uh, understand the why behind women's peace and security for certain countries like Tonga. And, and understanding the why from your perspective and how to communicate that and find out what their perspective is, is how you're going to move forward with the program from a practical application standpoint. So I tried to uh, talk with my team over here, and I also uh, luckily got paired up with Major Aris Mendy. He's also uh, tied to the Nevada National Guard in a, uh, in a SARC position, which is a sexual assault re a response coordinate coordinator. So he had a nice background and, and understanding of, of women's issues. You got me thrown in there, and we start building this team, and we had to understand why we were there. And at that point in time, we were there to to see if we could continue to build stability in their community and to see if we can push their military forward in a lot of the initiatives that you all have spoken about um, so far today. So the recipe that I can say we've, we've, we've garnered from this experience and, and what we took away from it were pretty much five different bullets. The first one was learn. And this is just a very practical, common sense approach to it. Learn about the country that you're dealing with. Learn about the people there. Learn about the culture. Learn about their traditions. And so Tonga is a beautiful country. Uh, it's actually, when I tell my, my friends and, and, uh, and colleagues you know, where Tonga is, I say it's in South Pacific, it's Polynesia Island, it's around Fiji, New Zealand, Australia, and they go, great, okay, I got an idea where it's at, perfect. And I say it's a, it's a, it's a smaller country. It's, a, it's about uh, 0.18 million people. And I learned this term from Commander Brisbane, who was in the Navy over there. He said that a very worldly man. He'd go out to all these different military conferences, and everyone were talking about their population in the millions, right? Well, Tonga's like less than 200,000 people. So to get any credibility, he goes, we have 0.18 million people. So that's the population. <laughs> I said, OK, Commander, I'll make sure and, 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 make sure and give you that plug. And so uh, in that uh, 0.18 million, though, there's a whole, I think it's like three times that actually out globally. So there's Tongans all over. Uh, the world in Australia and New Zealand they go and work there in the United States. Nevada, just weird, weird fun fact, we have the sixth largest population of Tongans in, in, in the U.S. So there you go. And uh, it's, a, it's a very, they have, they have a lot of pride. Uh, they're actually, they were dubbed the Friendly Islands by Captain Cook when he um, uh, discovered the island in the late 1700s. And uh, I think they actually were uh, intending to eat him, so it was a misnomer. <laughs> But he escaped, and that's what they are called. But to this day, they have a very hospitable culture, a very hospitable um, environment, in addition to the beautiful country. Uh, they have a lot of very deep family traditions and cultural values. Uh, they're a very religious country since, the, uh, I think, 1822. Christianity is the most prevalent religion. The, the country literally shuts down on Sunday. Uh, how many of you been there? I should have asked that. Because you're shaking your head. Yeah. Fantastic. Excellent. OK, so if you've been there, you know a lot of this stuff. They're, they're very conservative. And so, um, you know, it, it's, it, it's a, there are a, a lot of great things about Tonga that I think allowed us to uh, really be successful in our mission in May or earlier this month. And there were some roadblocks, too, based on tradition, based on culture, based on religion that you all have brought to light. Specifically in Tonga, they are a socially a matriarchal society. So they, ha they do put a lot of stock in the women 
and uh, the, the females are, are, are very highly esteemed in certain ceremonies and traditions uh, socially, but uh, politically, uh, uh, from a leadership standpoint, religiously, they are not typically the heads of those particular components, all right? So uh, I think a lot of um, uh, countries can relate to that, especially here in the Latin American pa panel today, but um, this is very specific for, for Tonga and in the Polynesia area in, in general. So that's the first step. So learning about the country and understanding that construct. Having gone twice before, um, uh, Colonel Lau goes quite a bit. We're starting to put our minds together, okay, what we're going to be our roadblocks going into this and what can we do to use that knowledge to better um, effectuate our, our, our mission uh, when we went there uh, earlier this month. So the next step I would say is listen. Uh, that sounds so simple, right? But it really isn't. It's, it's, it's listen to what they need. What, what, not from a U.S. perspective, what we need, but what they need. So I learned that the hard way going back to my September 2017, my first little conference that we had, going in there with about a team of uh, four female uh, um, um, U.S. military, and we had a conference about six or seven people, one being a man out of that group. And I'm just going through my slides for, okay, this is the United States National Action Plan 2011. It's fantastic. Going through, going through, going through. And I'm starting to, to read the emotion that the, their, their faces and, and the, 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 the one male officer, he was a, a commander of uh, the Navy, he, I could just see he was getting very disgruntled. And he's looking and I go, oh, I'm doing something wrong. You know, I'm just going through it. And I get to the very end of it and I said, do you have any questions? So he raises his hand and I said, yes, commander. He says, Dana, Tongans are, women are already smarter than the men. So if we put them in all these leadership positions, they are going to take over Tonga. And I go, Okay, no, that's not what I meant. No, 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 no. Let's let's back up. I see your insecurity. I get it, sir. No, what I meant is just you know let's let's just work about the four pillars of UNSCR. Let, let's talk about 325. Let's talk about more participation. How can we collaborate more? Okay, we, we can collaborate, Dana. But we're just they're not taking over this country. I said, okay, gotcha. And I was worried. I said I did not listen to them. I did not know that about them until I had this you know this this situation, and I went back to to Colonel Lau and I said I think I screwed up. I think this was a failed mission. He goes, nope, we're, I, I, I got this. And so that's the next thing, the next step. I learned through my team about the value of, of not only learning and listening about a country, but then building and building several things, which is the third step to the recipe. Building trust, building a team, and building a capability in a country. So going to Colonel Lau, who um, is a very enlightened male officer, which helped as well, uh, he says, no, Dana, I see this. We're going to figure this out, right? And, uh, and like I said, he brought in a better team. He brought Major Arismendi and gave me a whole other level of, of understanding and planning. And so from the building the trust, right, I had to have, we had to have a lot of buy-in. And I'll circle back to that, to, to that in a minute. But building the team was the first piece after learning, listening, getting to this next step, and building the team specifically uh, from the American perspective, what the U.S. military team was going to look like, and then what that Tongan team was going to look like. So we had to have both ways, otherwise this was not going to work going forward. Luckily on the U.S. team, we had a lot of people that, uh, uh, you know, led by with, without ego, which helped. So they, they were there to learn, and they were there because they believed in, in WPS. And then we had the subject matter experts like Dr. Rom, like Dr. Yamin, like, like Mickey Yakovich, which, you know, added so much depth and value to us moving forward. We couldn't have done it without them. And then also uh, building the capability. So, um, Colonel Lau comes to me and says, Dana, I'm really struggling with this whole capability thing. Because like I said, one of the missions that, uh, part of the, the mission set that, that SPP does is build interoperability, it builds different initiatives, uh, it builds professional, you name it. He goes, what capability are we talking about here? And I said, well, Colonel, okay, I got this. Let me think this through. Okay, I'm an attorney. I think logically. Let me just go through the steps. All right. Well, uh, Right now, they're trying to address a lot of major issues in the HADR lens, which is why I like the commander's presentation uh, quite a bit as well, because here they're trying to come up with a collaborative effort on how to address this major, the major, pro this major problem out there. It's natural disasters of, of, of cyclones, hurricanes, all this coming through. Okay, they don't have a lot of people there, 0.18 million people, right? So uh, their human capital is already rather low to address some of these problems. And okay, well, if they're not talking to half their population, they're going to really struggle to address these problems in a real way. And that's how I sold it to them. I said, this is a human capital capability. You're teaching them 
to not t turn a blind eye to half of the talent in their population. And just as simple as that. And once we established that, then it led us into the next step, and that was support. And the support that I'm talking about here specifically, the specific recipe for us, came with the stakeholders. Just like you need stakeholders in any national action plan, knowing your civil society, knowing your government, and everything else, you need it in the military in these mission sets. My stakeholder was Colonel Lau and my general, my TAG. And then on the Tongan side, we, interestingly enough, that commander that stepped up and made that comment the first, uh, that first trip I made, was the one that stood up, stood up and took over the, the entire uh, conference mission for Tonga. He ended up leading it. He had the buy-in. He believed in it. He got that through Colonel Lau, and then from there, my general and their general spoke, and that was when we had the entire thing turn around and say, okay, this is happening in May. Six, seven, six, seven months after our first initial failed, or I thought failed mission, because we'd taken those steps, and now we had the support of leadership. Now they were talking, now they believed in it, and they, and they, and they, and they moved the program forward. So now we've got a non-believer who's now r running this for Tonga. He puts on the WPS conference. He makes everything happen. We've got my generals talking. And what's the next step? Well, you're building that trust, right? And you're going to have to take it to the next level of leveraging. And that's what the conference did for us for the NAP. We were then able to bring in our subject matter experts. We were able to assess what was going on in the country. We had, we had meaningful conversations from civil society. Uh, we had a, a good group of about 15 to 20 people consistently show up on the Tongan side for, the, for a four to five day period. They came in, they were able to not only collaborate and learn from uh, the professors that attended, but then they were able to break out in small groups. They, talked, they tackled uh, specific topics on HADR, specific topics like um, domestic violence in the country, and they came up with solutions within those four or five days. And so basically, we then t moved forward to what's next, and that's where we're at, why we're here now and where we're at with, with Tonga, is what's next. And the Tongan timeline is to then draft an NAP. And what, that's gonna, what that is going to look like is going to be driven by Tongan and, and, and the people in the country, and it's also going to be driven by the military themselves. They have taken lead on this. So I open it up to all of you, too, is that moving forward, you are going to be part of that team. Your insight, your expertise, we would like to hear from you. And that's what we, what we are here for for this week, not only give you this practical, wonderful situation that happened in Tonga, but ask for your input, ask for your advice, ask for your leadership and how we can move this particular country forward in an NAP that uh, has never been done in Tonga before. So thank you so much. Thank you, Dana. Syrah, tell us about your work out in the Pacific. All right, thank you, Dodi. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm aloha to all of you. Uh, I'm from the Daniel K. Inouye Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies, DKI APCSS, in Honolulu, Hawaii. For those of you who don't know much about the center, we are a Department of Defense Executive Education Institution. And uh, we offer executive education courses ranging from one week to four week to five week uh, long intensive programs for security uh, studies practitioners, security practitioners from the Asia Pacific region in countries like Japan and Tonga uh, and also a number of other sub-regions in Asia, South, uh, Southeast Asia, uh, Northeast Asia of course, um, South Asia. Um, we also have a uh, number of uh, fellows, uh, we refer to our course participants as fellows from Latin America from North America. So we have a very wide audience. We have both military and civilian officials. Um, I uh, would like to talk about our executive education program in women, peace, and security, which we lo launched about uh, six years ago, soon after the unveiling of the US National Action Plan. Um, and I would like to talk about uh, some of the opportunities and challenges we have faced in integrating WPS into our security studies curricula. Now, perhaps one of our greatest challenges is the why question. Why? The why question that we get a lot from our security practitioners coming from all regions of the world. Why are we talking about women? in our security studies courses? Why are we giving 
uh, space to this topic in plenary discussions. Why can't we instead talk about North Korea or Russia? So that's one challenge. Another challenge is that women, peace, and security, the concept appears to challenge cultural values, and in some cases, religious values, right? Um, in some, situa in some um, cases, fellows think this is a Western concept, a Western ideal, a feminist concept, so to speak, because many of our fellows come from uh, societies which are very traditional, where the roles for social roles for men or women are very clearly, clearly defined. So this concept seems to challenge those roles. Uh, WPS, of course, is, um, is all about cultural change. So in a way, we are challenging those roles. We are talking about bringing about a change uh, in the way we do things, right? Uh, we are talking about change in the security sector. Another challenge we have is that with the nomenclature, women, peace, and security. What does it mean? Now, to a certain extent, it does give us uh, international legitimacy because this uh, agenda is aligned with the UNSCR 1325 global movement. But there are not many in the Asia-Pacific region who are really familiar with it. So what does it mean? Does it mean that women are more peaceful and better security builders than men? Does it mean that we are talking about displacing men from their jobs? So that's another challenge. Sometimes we tend to get very defensive talking about women, peace, and security. No, this is not an antidote to men, war, and violence. This is about inclusion. It's not about exclusion. It's about women working together with men. Now, ladies and gentlemen, these challenges also present many opportunities for us as an executive education institution. To the question, why women, that we get very often uh, directly from our, uh, from our course participants and in the course evaluations that we uh, conduct. It's an opportunity for us to highlight that women are equal stakeholders in security. Like, um, we all recognize that women represent 50% of the global population, 50% generally of all countries, of all regions. And women are impacted equally by security challenges, both traditional and non-traditional. That women are actually more vulnerable in today's battle zones than they were during World War II. To quote a UN peacekeeping commander, it is more dangerous for a woman than it is to be a soldier in today's war zones. And why is that? It is because, first of all, 90% of the casualties today in today's warfare are communities, not soldiers, compared to the world wars of the previous century, but also because women are more vulnerable. They're at greater risk for gender-based sexual violence, greater risk for uh, sexually transmitted diseases, certainly greater risk for forced pregnancies, uh, greater risk for maternal mortality. According to the World Health Organization, 50% of all annual maternal mortality uh, mortality occurs in conflict is in disaster zones. So women are impacted by traditional security threats as well as non-traditional security threats. And Junko san talked about some of them. She talked about humanitarian disasters, natural disasters. We know that in Asia Pacific region, women for, let's say in the uh, Indian Ocean tsunami, for every one man who died, there were four women who were killed, who drowned. Why is that? Disasters don't discriminate against women, but it so happens that women in the region don't have survival skills. They don't have coping skills for cultural reasons. They don't know how to swim. They don't know how to climb trees. In Bangladesh, which is very, very prone to natural disasters, women don't want to take off their saris, you know, these wraps, because uh, they're concerned about their safety. They don't want to go to evacuation centers because they are not segregated. They don't have privacy. 
Then there are issues such as terrorism. Uh, terrorism is not a new problem. It's been there for a long time. But women are increasingly being recruited by terrorist groups. Um, women, suicide bombers, for example, have a four times higher kill rate than men. Why is that? Because of the element of surprise. So we've got to be able to bring women to the table and talk to them and understand their motivations. Uh, why are they gravitated uh, towards uh, terrorist groups? They're both, uh, women are agents of insecurity and also agents of security. We've got to recognize that women are equal stakeholders my apologies. Uh, and we've got to understand that the security environment is becoming more complex and it's evolving. And in order to understand the big picture, we have to integrate the gender perspective. Um, another uh, element, let's say I can, uh, example I can provide of women's relevance to uh, security is that of human trafficking. Women, 80% of the victims of human trafficking are women and children. Now, human trafficking generates the largest portion of crimi criminal income worldwide. It is closely tied to international terrorism, to drug trafficking, to money laundering, to document forgery. So it is a national and international security threat. It's not just a non-traditional threat. So by highlighting some of these linkages, we have an opportunity to talk about the important role women play in the security sector. Now, how, how does my institution integrate WPS into our programs? We have a four-pillar four approach. And if you have uh, access to my paper, um, it, all the details are given in there. I'm going to talk about two of the pillars. Uh, but let me identify those pillars for you. The first pillar is recruitment of women. Uh, we have a 25% recruitment goal for all our course participants. The second pillar is uh, modeling inclusion through a faculty gender balance. The third pillar is layered integration of WPS-themed discourse. And then finally, research and publication. So I'll talk about the two, recruitment first and layered integration of WPS theme discourse. So recruitment, we strive to have at least 25% women in all our courses. And the 25% the women that we do get obviously do not represent uh, the ground reality uh, of women's inclusion in the security sector in the Asia Pacific, but we, we work very hard to get it, uh, to do this, and we are able to do so. Why, why is that number important? It's, um, it's our way of ensuring that the gender perspective is meaningfully integrated in our security-related discourses. Uh, there is a theory called women's um, uh, the, uh, women's uh, leadership of, uh, w this is the critical mass theory of women's leadership, which argues that there's a loosely defined critical mass of 20 to 30 percent needed for effective integration of the women's perspective, whether it is at the policy making level, decision making level, at all levels. That unless you have this number of women, women are going to remain a minority that are not going to be able to articulate their perspective meaningfully. So that's one thing we do. And what we have learned that by having this number of women, about 25 percent, and sometimes we are able to uh, surpass this number, we are really able to change the dynamic of the discourses we have in our courses. It changes the conversation. We discuss issues that are not normally talked about, and that enriches our understanding, it broadens our understanding of security, uh, and uh, helps us put the pieces of the uh, puzzle together. The second important uh, pillar is the layered integration of WPS in our courses, which means we have it, we introduce this topic in plenary, we offer electives, we offer BBLs, but importantly, 
We have seminar discussions. These are closed group environments where uh, the security practitioners come together and we give them the opportunity to open up and talk about all their questions about all their concerns and reservations about having more women in the security sector. And as, uh, as Yuri very kindly, you know, he talked about machismo. This is an issue that, you know, we have this challenge. Security is a concept that is seen as the men's domain. So, so we give security practitioners the opportunity to open up and address these topics and um, we give them uh, the, the opportunity to learn from each other. And it's very, very powerful in helping bring about that paradigm shift. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to uh, end my presentation and open it up for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Siren. Questions, please, before lunch. Sir. Uh, very quickly, I'm wondering, uh, I was wondering the Latin American panel, but also in the Pacific, do you see a generational dimension to this? In other words, are the younger generations who are more globally connected uh, to more progressive ideas, do they view these things differently than those who are much older, perhaps in the senior leadership position? So would this suggest perhaps hope, if that's the case? Um, because I've seen that, I've seen generational stark generational differences, not only in Latin America, in some countries, but also in Africa, where we spend a lot of time. So in my experience, yes, that generational difference is there, but I think, I think experience also makes a difference. And I find that men in leadership positions are sometimes more open to the idea than younger men. And I also find that it is the men in leadership positions who have the political will to actually support this agenda, they're the ones who are often more instrumental than the, than the younger ones. Sir, if I, if I may, achieving 25% is impressive any, for any target group you go after. How did you manage to do that? that the nuts and bolts. Yes, so we, um, I should mention, talking about men's leadership, our program was uh, launched under the leadership of uh, Lieutenant General uh, Daniel Figleaf, who, he's a champion of women, peace, and security. And he made, uh, he drafted this director's memo. So when we sent out invitations to our, um, to different countries, he, he attached a memo from General Leaf saying, we want more women. That memo made a huge difference. And uh, we provide, you know, we, uh, we have conferences where uh, our recruiters go out into the region and talk to US embassies who engage with governments. And they try to sensitize them about this issue. So there's a lot of hard work involved. But we have a lot of support from our directors. And after General Leaf left, we had General uh, Hartzell, who was actually making phone calls to different US embassies, imagine that, saying we want more women, because initially this effort was not uh, gaining a lot of traction. So this is a top level uh, priority for our center. And under General Leaf, it was actually the uh, institution's top priority. When you, I, I assume you didn't get to 25% the first time. Yes. When you fell short of your desired goal, did you leave those seats empty? Uh, no, we didn't leave our seats empty, and we have progressively improved. And I would also like to say that uh, this effort has had a trickle-down effect because uh, the OSD has now asked all regional centers to have 25% women in their courses. They are not all managing that because I suppose they don't have that level of leadership commitment, but we have that guidance now from the Office of the Secretary of Defense. Ma'am. Yes, uh, my question is for Major Gregg. Uh, Major Gregg, with the recent passage of Congress passing the Women in Peace and Security Act, is that something that you would like to see replicated legally in Tonga, or is the UN Resolution 1325 enough? 
So unfortunately, it's not my choice since I go there and I'm just suggesting. <clears throat> but uh, something like that will obviously um, allow us to give them an example of, hey, it's being done here. But you have to be careful with that, too. You know, obviously, again, uh, you go in there and you tell a country what they want. It doesn't go over very well. So uh, from a lawyer perspective and in drafting any of this going forward, yes, I'll be looking to that. But uh, I also um, feel that if we just looked at that and we don't look to the current existing laws in Tonga itself, uh, we may be missing the mark because what works for us isn't going to exactly work for them. Can I add to that? Um, I should mention that the United States is the only country in the world with the Women, Peace and Security Act right now. And right now it's in planning phases. The President has to report to the Congress on 1st of October how he's going to take it forward. Uh, the National Action Plans on Women, Peace and Security, they have gained a lot of traction. We have about 74 around the world as of last month, but only 17 have budgets associated with them. So doing a National Action Plan right should, I think, would be a great first start. Right now we just have a lot of documents. I think a lot of countries are doing it to look good, but they're not implementing those plans necessarily. Very good. Well, uh, I think we don't have time for any more questions. It's time to go to lunch. I want to thank our panel members for their great presentations. I want to thank the audience for those great questions. Ladies, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to be your moderator. Thank you. Thank you.